Ezra Mendelssohn is Professor Emeritus of, at the Institute of Contemporary Jewry and in the Department of Russian and Eastern, East European Studies at Hebrew University. His first book, Class Struggle in the Pale, The Formative Years of the Jewish Workers' Movement in Tsarist Russia, appeared in 1970 and established him as one of the post-Holocaust generation's pioneer historians of the Jewish left and modern Jewish politics in general. He followed up with Zionism in Poland, the formative years, 1915 to 1926, which won the Efroikin Prize in the history of Jews of Eastern, on the history of Jews of Eastern Europe, and the Jews of East Central Europe between uh, the world wars. His On Modern Jewish Politics, honored with the Arnold uh, Vishnitzer uh, Prize for the best book in the field of modern Jewish history, remains the best short introduction to the subject. And if, you, if any of you have students, and I think it's getting increasingly difficult, uh, this, people in this room notwithstanding, to, for, for young people to understand the different issues and, and contexts and, that motivated all of this uh, history that we've been talking about, uh, this, is, uh, this book uh, on modern Jewish politics is the best uh, brief introduction to the field. Uh, more recently, Professor Mendelssohn has turned his attention to the subject of Jews and art. His painting of people, Maritzi Gottlieb, and Jewish art was co-winner of the Orbis Prize for best work in the field of Polish studies and the Bialik Prize in Israel for Jewish history. He has edited or co-edited co numerous collections, including most relevantly for this conference, the uh, essential papers on Jews and the left, and many volumes in the series Studies in Contemporary Jewry. Uh, in addition to Hebrew University, uh, Professor Mendelssohn has taught at Boston University, the University of Michigan, UCLA, uh, JTS, uh, French school which, whose name I can't pronounce, the University of Washington, Seattle, Columbia University, Duke University, Central European University in Budapest. Thankfully, they didn't, uh, didn't give uh, the name of it in Hungarian on your CV, and New York University. A native New Yorker, Professor Mendelssohn received his PhD from Columbia University, and since the subject of Yichus came up earlier, I just want to mention that his, uh, his father, uh, Isaac Mendelssohn, in addition to being a pioneer scholar of uh, slavery in antiquity, uh, under the pseudonym Aleph Mandel, uh, wrote a brief uh, primer uh, called Anthropologia, the Primitiva Gesellschaft, uh, which was published by the International Workers' Order uh, in 1937. And uh, uh, to make his Yichus even noch gresser, uh, his uh, mother, Fanny uh, Sawyer Mendelssohn, was my grandfather's sister. So uh, <laughs> it gives me great pleasure to um, introduce Professor Ezra Mendelssohn. Thank you. It's always nice to be introduced by a cousin because he's not going to stop me in the middle, I think. Um, one of uh, the problems of wrapping up a conference is that everything I intend to say has already been said. And I have to deal with that somehow, and I will do my best not to be too repetitive. Uh, I want to start by reminding you of what was mentioned at the beginning of this uh, fine conference, and that is that this is the second YIVO conference on Jews and the left. In 1964, YIVO organized a conference which was called in Yiddish, uh, Forsch Konferenz, von Yivo wegen jüdischen Anteil in Bewegungen, the Teuvis Sozialen Progress. Quite a mouthful. Uh, uh, and uh, this was an important event in the history of Yivo, I think. It was a, one of the early reaching out, reachings out of Yivo to the American scholarly world, uh, coming out of its ghetto, as it were at a time when very few people studied Yiddish and very few American universities offered courses in Jewish history. Uh, the language of the conference was English with some Yiddish and a lot of bickering about that back in 64. None today, I think. One of the changes that has taken place in our world. Uh, I think I'm one of the last survivors of this conference because I actually read a paper at that conference. I was 23 years old, and uh, it was a conference in which a lot of fairly young people were uh, starting to work in the field of the Jewish left, especially the East European Jewish left, both Israelis and Americans and some Europeans. Um, 
Many of these people have uh, departed. My friend Jonathan Frankel, uh, probably the greatest scholar of this subject in Eastern Europe and in America too, many, uh, died a couple of years ago. Moshe Mishkinsky, who was the, I think, leading Israeli scholar of the subject of East European Jewish Socialism is long gone. Many other scholars who spoke at that conference are gone. Um, and now we have a new generation, or two, and we have seen some of them at this conference, and it's very uh, rewarding to see them uh, doing what we were doing way back then, some 50 years ago. Uh, I thought the first reflection that I want to share with you would be to discuss the differences between then and now, the 60s and today, in dealing with the subject of Jews and the left. Um, this is pretty personal, but I think may stand for more than just my own feelings. I mean, broadly speaking, back in the 60s, we young historians and other kinds of scholars were writing in a context in which the left was very much alive, generally speaking and Jewishly speaking, very much with us. Of course, the Soviet Union had been revealed to be a, a, a horrendous place. At least most people thought so, even on the left. But there were some hopeful signs within the communist bloc then that maybe we would get something like socialism with a human face. Yugoslavia seemed pretty good. We didn't know much about it, but we thought it was uh, not bad. Soon there would be Dubček in Prague. Social democracy was thriving in some parts of Europe, and movements associated with the left were even strong in America. After all, this was the era of the civil rights movement, the anti-war movement, the women's movement, the student movement. This was all in the air. Uh, so uh, it was a context in which the left was pretty strong and pretty viable in general. And a lot of people were writing about it and active in it. Um, as far as the Jewish world is concerned, it's true that the old Jewish-speaking left in America was dead by the 60s, more or less dead. Um, and in both East Europe and America, the Holocaust and integration had taken care of it, more or less. Uh, but its memory was green. We remembered it. We knew a lot of people who had been active in it. It wasn't so long dead. Its memory was with us. And some of its activists were still around. Um, we could make the case that in the 60s, the old Jewish universalism and idealism which had powered the Jewish left was still very much alive. There were a lot of veterans of the socialist movement around who could inspire us and who were interested in writing about the left and working on the left, people like Irving Howe. Uh, a lot of uh, graduates of Jewish youth movements were around, Yif Aboni, Marshal Merat Sayyid, active in left-wing movements. Uh, there were a lot of red diaper babies around. I was one of them. People who came from left-wing families and whose parents were still around and could tell them about it, although things had changed, of course, since the 30s, but still, the movement somehow was alive. And uh, as we all know, the uh, romance of the Jews uh, and the left in the 60s was very much uh, a fact of life. Uh, the role of Jews in the civil rights movement, amazing. In the interwar movement, as, as was just mentioned in the women's movement, in the student movement. This has been discussed in these last two days. This seemed to prove that if the Jewish left was dead, at least Jews in the left were very much alive. And that was something, uh, that was something that inspired us, that filled us with a certain degree of hope that this would continue and that we were work, what we were working on was something uh, of value uh, in the arts, you think about it, and Danny mentioned that I take an interest now in the history of Jews in the arts. If you think about the arts and Jewish participation in the arts in America, there were universalists all over the place. There was Leonard Bernstein, and there was Aaron Copeland, 
There was Arthur Miller, there was Ben Sean, there were the social realists. Uh, they were there, they were alive, they were working. And they were promoting ideas which we associated with the idealism of the Jewish left. Uh, and most important, I think, for some of us anyway, who had Zionist inclinations, Israel was still a socialist country, so we thought. We had not yet heard Yoav Pellet. <laughs> and I am not criticizing him. But we didn't believe in that. We, we, it didn't occur to us that such a thing could be, that it was an imperialist movement. No. We believed it was a socialist, that socialism had created Israel. This was the greatest triumph of the Jewish left. Uh, my friend Israel Getzler, another man who has recently died, belonged to our generation, older even than I, if that is uh, possible. He said to me, Israel, uh, Israel, the state, is a social democracy with teeth. And I believed him. I believed that for a long time. Maybe I still believe to some extent, maybe not today, but we believed that then. Israel was a socialist country founded by social democrats who came out of the Russian revolutionary tradition, like Ben Gurion and Ben Svi and all the others, almost all the others. The Histadrut was a power. We thought it was a symbol of Israeli socialism. The kibbutz movement was thriving, and it was seen that was the ultimate victory of Jewish socialism, the pinnacle of Jewish socialist success. What could be more successful than that? And the utopian movements maybe were in America for a while in the 19th century, but this was a going concern. Jewish labor, Jewish men and women who had transformed themselves from miserable shtetl uh, clerks and, uh, and uh, tailors into agriculturalists. They lived on the land. They were doing what the Jewish left and the left in general believed was right, productivization, no exploitation. No exploited, no exploitation. And uh, this inspired us with a feeling that the Jewish left was victorious in, in some way. Um, and let us remember that in 1964, the great Jewish religious revival had not yet occurred. We thought that that was finished. My parents regarded the Jews of Borough Park as being in a, living in a museum. And it's not, I mean, that's what they thought. It was, as they said, Euskerspiel played out. The cult of the Shoah as the great event, terrible event in Jewish history, had not yet happened. And that is a uh, phenomenon of great significance when thinking about Jews on the left. And this has been mentioned here, that the Shoah was not yet, it took time for it to emerge, certainly in Israel and in America too. Um, above all, 1964 was three years before 1967, a war which had fateful implications for the Jewish left. Fateful may be fatal too. Uh, nobody thought of such a thing as happening. Israel was a Jewish nation state, the small minority which didn't seem to matter very much. And uh, given all of this together, I think it was understandable that for us, back in 1964 and the mid-60s, um, we thought that our work on the Jewish left would illuminate a, 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 a phenomenon that we thought was the most positive and enduring force in the Jewish world of the late 19th, early 20th century, or even of the whole modern era. As Michael Walzer said, there was no Jewish socialism before the emancipation. Well, I don't know. Was there socialism at all before that? I don't know. No. But anyway, um, we thought that this was a movement that had painted a glorious picture, and then written a glorious page in modern Jewish history. It had democratized Jewry. It had 
made the social democratic state of Israel possible. And that was, all, after all, the greatest event in modern his Jewish history for many of us, for Frankel, for me, certainly for the Israeli historians, for Mishkinsky, for Ettinger, for that whole group. Um, we thought that this was a movement that had aligned the Jewish masses and the Jewish intelligentsia with the world's struggle for human rights, the rights of women and minorities, social justice, an end to exploitation. And we thought to this Pacha Michael Walter again, that these were forces deeply rooted in Jewish history. That's what we thought. And our parents thought that way. And they told us that when Amos said, Allah Atam Kushi Libne Israel, are you not as Ethiopians to me, O children of Israel? We thought that was meaningful. This was a Jewish prophet who said, all men are equal. And uh, when uh, it says in the Torah, Lo tamol adam re'acha, do not stand idly by, we thought that meant something. That was linked in our minds with the modern struggles for social justice of the Jewish people. I remember asking Jonathan Frankel, why are you working on this immense book on the history of Jewish uh, socialism in Russia and America and Palestine? And he said, I want to know how we got to where we are today. That's what we thought. Um, at least some of us thought that way. And that was back in 1964 at the first conference of the evil, that the evil held on Jews on the left. Today, we live in a very different world. I don't have to tell you that. And from the point of view of the left and Jews on the left, it looks a lot bleaker. Uh, a lot bleaker. Um, Socialist Europe has been replaced by nationalist Europe to a great extent. Yugoslavia is an example of that. What happened there? The great social experiment of Tito, maybe it was not so great, but it was something we thought was something, has collapsed into the creation of a bunch of little fascist states, or more or less fascist states. You know, Russia, we don't have to talk about. We know a lot more today than we did then about Soviet and communist terror. I mean, that's a fact. Maybe we should have known more back in the 60s. Uh, we knew something. But now we know a lot more. We are post Solzhenitsyn and post everything. Um, and in the Jewish world, the most dramatic change is, is Israel. Um, we have today in Israel uh, the rise of, uh, I'm not taking political positions here, I'm just telling you what, is, what the facts are on the ground. We have the rise of integral nationalism, a kind of European variety, which is very well known, which is not tolerant, and which is uh, um, obsessed with emphasizing national unity at uh, any price, and above, all, above everything else and that means Jewish unity, and is linked to an Orthodox Jewish establishment. And the linking of uh, Orthodox Judaism, which we heard a lot about from Professor Walter, and I agree with him, uh, the linking of Orthodox Judaism of this kind to integral secular nationalism is a fateful event in Jewish history, and that is what we have today in the state of Israel. That's not all we have, but well, this is most, this is, this is the truth. These are the facts. This is what the Jewish people who live in Israel want, at least now. Um, and of course, our thoughts about social democratic Israel are in big trouble. And those who still believe in that tradition are in big trouble, if there was such a tradition. Um, we have uh, the triumph of the anti-enlightenment. Not that the enlightenment was perfect, but we believed in it. And in some of its tenets, many of its tenets, today we have the triumph of the anti-enlightenment. Not complete, not complete. And we see this in American Jewry as well, not everywhere for sure. But here and there, we see it very clearly. 
And we see here, too, an alliance between fundamentalist religion and strong, integral Jewish nationalism. We have an obsession with anti-Semitism today, with the Shoah in particular, but in general with anti-Semitism. And of course, the memories of the old Jewish left are fading, or have faded completely. If you ask a young Israeli today, if I don't mention this young Jew in America, who was Ber Barachov, he has no idea. In the old days, people wrote dissertations about him. No more. Or almost no more. The main thing, I think, is that when you look at things today in 2012, from the point from the, the issue of Jews in the left, you have a feeling that maybe this whole movement, this tremendous, powerful movement that created a new Jewish world, well, Yiddish-speaking, Hebrew-speaking, but a world united by common values and idealism, and all the unions and the newspapers and the uh, educational institutions and the schools and the camps and the uh, uh, fraternal and the whole business and the co-ops, all that, maybe it was just a kind of blip on the radar screen of Jewish history, just a little and it's gone. Um, this is, uh, this is something which is very sobering to think about, especially for us, who thought that this was the main path of Jewish history. And now we are thinking again, or at least I am thinking again, that maybe that whole world was a one generation, or maybe at best two generations. Professor Walter also mentioned that. The difficulties of passing this down to another generation. Maybe it just was the... Uh, result of special historical circumstances, which are gone. And we have the great Jewish continuity of religion and hatred of Gentiles. And uh, it's not funny. And Am Levado Yishko, people dwells alone. And the whole business that we thought we had buried, but it is burying us. Uh, and in particular, I think the phenomenon of the rapid growth of Orthodox Judaism, here too, but in Israel in particular, which is a fundamental fact of life for us, for those of us who live in Israel. Um, I'm an editor of a Hebrew, the Hebrew historical journal in Israel called Zion. I know that in the old days we used to get articles about um, Meir Ya'ari's three-stage uh, theory of Jew development of Jewish socialism. Now, he was the leader of Hashem Eretz here. And Ber Borokhov's theory of productivization. And uh, Beryl Katznelson on the importance of uh, Shabbat or something like that. And today we get articles on Hasidut. Um, not only, I don't mean to say only, but this is a sign of the times. This is what people are working on. Borokhov is known today, and I, I don't know why I talk about him so much, but he was an important character for me in the 60s. Borokhov is known only as a street sign. I mean, people know Rokhov Borokhov, but they have no idea who he was. And so uh, we, it looks like, from the perspective of today, that we have an entirely different world, both general and Jewish, to contend with, a world which is very unfriendly to uh, the Jewish left, uh, although less unfriendly to Jews in the left. And I would maintain an important distinction between those two things. My second reflection, am I okay? Yeah. Has to do with the blessings and curses of the Jewish romance with the left. Um, how do we uh, evaluate the fact, and it is a fact, that so many Jews in modern times tied their fate, both collectively and individually, with movements of the left. Again, either in collective Jewish forms, as a Bund or social science, Polizia, or something like that, or as individuals, and we've heard a lot about this today, whether as Rosa Luxemburg, as an individual, or you know, Vladimir Medim as leader of the Bund, something like that. Should we celebrate it? 
or not? Or was the price too high? These are questions that arise in the mind of a historian, and some of our speakers have uh, discussed this. Um, I think that on the whole, uh, we tend to take pride in the prominence of Jews on the left. It's a little bit like the game of saying, oh, so many great Jews. And for people on the left, they play that game by thinking about the great Jewish socialists and communists. Uh, we, we were proud of Marx. Maybe he was an anti-Semite, but okay. <laughs> no, really, we, 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 we overlooked that. In a modern collection of the writings of Rosa Luxemburg in Hebrew, her famous letter in which she talks about the problem of having no room in her heart for the ghetto and so forth, so it's left out. This is edited by Shulamit Aloni. Um, we were proud of those Hungarian Jews, maybe 90%, 80%, 30%, we don't know, who, who were in Bela Kunz. And we thought Bela Kunz, he was a Jew too. Although, you know, how to measure how many depends on how you define a Hungarian Jew, which is very difficult. <laughs> we were proud that Tito had a Jewish friend, comrade. Moshe Piada. He was a, we knew about him. Um, we were proud of all those Jewish Mensheviks. We loved Martov and Axelrod. And friends of ours were writing their biographies. Israel Getzler wrote the biography of Martov. And Abe Asher, who I think is another survivor of that 64 conference, wrote the biography of Axelrod. Um, we were proud of the German and Austrian social democrats. We were proud of the Bolshevik Jews too. Trotsky for sure because he showed that a Jew who not only can sit in an attic and write polemics, but he can be a man of action. And Red Rosa, luckily, she died before she could take power. I and mean, that's why I feel about maybe this is not. And she was a martyr. Yogishus was once a bit of a pre-Bundist, as was mentioned, but he was a martyr too. Uh, we thought that these men and women, along with Jewish movements of the left, were in the forefront of world history. They proved the Jewish connection to social progress and enlightenment values. They showed that Jewry was on the right side of history. They won the support and loyalty of the masses even, including Gentile masses. I think today our, my take on this is different. I uh, think a lot of us feel differently, not everybody. A lot of us feel differently about this. Of course, we all knew about the price that Jews paid for the alliance with the left, of some Jews, if not, as, as has been mentioned here. The numbers have been exaggerated. They were not always that great, but still. In the IWO, oh my God. Um, we knew about Judo Komuna, Jewish communism, and it's Polish, and, and the, how much hatred that aroused among non-Jews, in Eastern Europe especially. Um, and particularly with regard to the role of Jews in the Soviet regimes 39-41, 40-41, and then post-45 in Eastern Europe, which has been mentioned here. Uh, I, 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 that, that's a problem, of course, which many Jews were conscious of. If you read Applebaum, you'll find out. But I want to mention another aspect of this problem, and that is the uh, price that many of us paid for um, adhering to a kind of universalism, which uh, in the end was rather, I think, destructive. Um, let me say what I think about this, and then uh, this relates a bit to what we heard about Lillian Hellman. Um, I think that the greatest disaster, and it was really a disaster, of the Jewish romance with the left was the fact that tens of thousands, maybe hundreds of thousands of Jews identified with and battled for and defended communism at a time when the communist regimes were regimes of murder and torture. Solzhenitsyn may exaggerate, but I think he has a point. Um, 
I follow here the, an article, one of the last articles that my friend Jonathan Frankel wrote before he died, in which he said, if we are proud of Felix Mendelssohn and Gustav Mahler and Albert Einstein and so forth, then should we not be ashamed of those Jews who were active in communist movements or supported communist movements that we know now, uh, we know now what they were like. Um, I think especially of Jews not in the living in communist states where the choices were few and the pressures were great. Um, I think especially because of who I am, I guess, and where I grew up, I think especially of the Jews in the so-called free world who backed a movement that in the Soviet Union and then later in Eastern Europe and elsewhere, were, were they, these were movements that tortured thousands and hundreds of thousands of people and murdered hundreds and thousands of people, including Jews, of course, as we all know. Um, I especially dislike, and I think that um, this is personal, of course, but I especially feel rather strongly about those Jews who were communists back in the, back in the day, as they say, and that was okay. And then after the war, or after 56, or after 68, or after whatever, reinvented themselves as social democrats, and everything was fine. But it isn't fine, I think. Um, there's an exhibition up here on the Jewish press. I did a bit of work on Der Hammer once. It was the uh, communist uh, news weekly or monthly, I think it's monthly, uh, uh, Yiddish monthly uh, uh, run by the Jewish part of the American Communist Party. And if you look at the cartoons in Freiheit and Der Hammer, it's unbelievable. It is really horrendous. And then one of the famous cartoonists was a man named William Gropper. He was an American-born communist, or pro-communist. I don't know if he was a member of the party. Well, after all of this and after communism was revealed to be not so nice, he just sort of forgot. I mean, he just forgot about it. He became a, a progressive. Um, I find this very, very disturbing. Danny mentioned, and this is personal, that... These are reflections, reflections are personal. Danny mentioned that my father wrote a book in Yiddish in the 30s, 37. That was for the uh, Arbeiter Universität, the Workers' University, which was the IWO, the Communist uh, Fraternal Society, um, on anthropology. In this book he says, we, uh, I don't know why he got into this subject at all, he said, uh, the national problem is very difficult to solve. It has only been solved in one country, the Soviet Union. I'm ashamed of that, I admit it. I feel shame. There is a difference between guilt and shame. I don't know about guilt. Guilt is one thing, shame is another. I am I'm ashamed of that. Because I know now, we know now how the national problem was solved in the Soviet Union. And now I want to mention something that Professor Walzer mentioned correctly, although I challenged him a little bit on it, and that is that this Jewish urge to universalism in place of the of traditional Jewish life, or even bourgeois Jewish life, um, caused a lot of us to abandon Jewishness altogether, and it exacted a very high price I think psychologically, identifying with the oppressed, identifying with everyone who isn't you. Um, this pro produces a very profound kind of alienation. And the psychological price that we paid for that was very high, I think. And we were all often rebuffed. I myself was a minor figure in the civil, well, not figure, I mean, I took part in the civil rights movement in the 1960s, and I remember what happened when black power came along and all kinds of people came along and said, what are you Jews doing in our movement? Get out of here, get out. And of course, there's nothing new about this in the history of the Jewish left or Jews in the left, being rebuffed by people you want to save. 
Um, this goes back to the populace of the 1870s in Russia, not only Jews, who tried to go to the peasants, and the peasants sometimes handed them over to the police. I think about the Bund in Poland between the wars, which there's a very man here who knows a lot more about it than I do, but I know how desperately the Bund, which was a Jewish left-wing movement, but not talking here about it, how desperately they wanted to be accepted by non-Jews. How desperately they wanted to march in May Day celebrations with the Polish socialists, and sometimes they did. And how they were sometimes rebuffed. And how they sometimes discovered that the world of Polish socialism was not quite what they thought it was. Sometimes, not always. Sometimes it was truly universal. But it's a complicated story. Um, and someone has mentioned here that in 1881, when 81-82, during the wave of pogroms, there were Russian socialists or Ukrainian socialists who justified these pogroms, just as the communists justified 1929 in Chevron, and just as the communists in 39 justified the Hitler, uh, Stalin, uh, Molotov-Ribbentrop Pact as justified, as necessary, and so forth and so on. I think that um, we Jews in the left, some of, some of them have paid a high price. Universalism is a good thing. I, I embrace it. But it must be, I think, associated with respect for one's own ethnicity and one's own identity. Not at, its, at the price of wiping that out. And um, I know about this from my family. And I know about this from friends. Um, the well-known phenomenon you know, of supporting everyone. But when it came to Soviet Jews and their struggle for emigration, um, no, not that. There's something terrible about this, um, something debilitating, something profoundly awful about it, uh, which uh, many Jews have experienced, and it is one of the tragedies of the Jewish link to the left, I think. It doesn't have to be, but it has been, and uh, we have to take this in mind, I think. I am not particularly feeling very um, forgiving of Jews who joined the communist movement. Um, even though I understand the communists were fighting for civil rights and find that this is the great paradox of communism. When it is not in power, it fights for civil rights. When it is in power, it kills. And uh, uh, I am not as, well, maybe in the question period this can be discussed a little bit. Uh, I don't know enough about Lillian Hellman to say. Uh, if she was in the Communist Party in 1939, well, I, I don't know. Uh, the last thing I want to say, I have a couple more minutes, right? Yeah. The last thing I want to wonder about is whether the, there is a future for the Jewish left. This is my last reflection. I think somebody asked that question yesterday, and his answer was, I don't know, which is honest. I forget who that was and in what context that was. Um, uh, well, if you look around the world today, you see a lot of what you see, I think, mostly is the triumph not of socialism but of nationalism. And these are the great rivals of Jewish politics. Sometimes they were combined, but never easily. There is Jewish nationalism, there is Jewish socialism. And Israel today is, is going the way of so many other nation states. And there is a Yiddish expression which says, As the Christians go, so go the Jews. Um, and I think that there is something in that, even though the socialists won the election in France yesterday. So maybe that is something a little bit surprising. 
Uh, on the other hand, um, there is a long tradition of Jewish leftism. And here, I, I, I don't really accept the idea that it was all invented in the 19th century. Um, you know, it's hard to argue about this in, in the Tanakh, in the, in the Bible, the prophets, Jesus, who has been reclaimed as a, as a fellow Jew ever since the 19th century. Doesn't that count for something? There is a tradition in Jewish thought, even in rabbinic thought, of a kind of universalism. What about the seven commandments of Noah? Sheva mitzvot Noah, which say that if Gentiles obey seven basic laws, they don't have to do ten. They only have to do seven. But they're the main ones. Actually, I don't remember them all, so don't ask me. <laughs> I think there's some rather odd ones there. But anyway, if they do that, they have a place in the, in the Baulam Abba, in the coming world, in the next world. I don't think this is nothing can be just sort of waved away. Even if they didn't mean it. I mean, we don't know what the prophets meant. Uh, when Isaiah said, my house shall be a house of prayer for all peoples, my, oh, who knows what he meant. But it seems like he meant something universalist. Uh, although there are, you know, there are big debates about this. When it says, who is who is my friend? Is it maybe only a Jewish friend? And then there is the famous Midrash about the Jew, the uh, Egyptians drowning in the Red Sea. And the Jews are shouting and cheering. And God says, don't uh, cheer and shout and sing. These are my creatures. Even I know this. And I don't know much about you know, rabbinic. And it, it's there. You know, so if you look for it, you find it. And uh, I agree, it is not the mainstream, perhaps. Even in Hasidut, there is a kind of universalism. Actually, to some extent, this is maintained today by Reform Judaism. It's Reform Judaism, and it is a force, and it has its adherents, maintains that the Jewish tradition is perfectly um, compatible with uh, social justice. And they change the liturgy from the Hebrew, which is, you know, uh, Yisrael, 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 and the Reformed Jews say Yisrael, uvichol b'nei ha'adam, all men, or men and women. So there is that, there is a kind of DNA there. I, I really believe this, that there is something that is in our tradition that um, pushes us a little bit in the direction of the left. And of course, there are objective social and economic conditions. The Jews in the diaspora are still a minority. They are still vulnerable. There is still anti-Semitism and plenty of it. And this may also push Jews in a left-wing tradition. And we know how Jews vote in America. Um, but to my mind, and I'm going to end with this, the future of the Jewish left uh, resides in Israel. Uh, maybe this, I say this because I live there. I have lived there for 50 years, more or less, although I spent a lot of time traveling around, as you heard, teaching at other universities. Um, I mean, that, that is the only place, I think, in the world where a Jewish left in the traditional sense of the word, that what we mean, a movement combining what some of the old scholars of the left call traditional Jewish idealism with autonomous Jewish culture, now Hebrew, not Yiddish, but still. This is the only place where a movement like that can emerge. It could be a movement combining an insistence on treating non-Jews with respect, and with an emphasis on social justice for the Jewish community and the non-Jewish community living in that state. It, it, it doesn't look too good now, but history moves in a dialectic, as Marx taught us. And maybe I will not see it, but my grandchildren will. Uh, it, would nice, it would be nice to see uh, 
the emergence in Israel. I don't, I don't, I don't give, have any hope for it to emerge here. A Jewish left. Jews on the left, yes. A Jewish left, no. I don't think. But in Israel, it would, nice, it would be nice to see a movement of, emerge which would combine something of the idealism of the old Jewish left. Bund, and social democrats, and all of that world uh, with a strong commitment to the continued existence of the Jewish people, living in a social democratic state. I, I wouldn't expect a movement like that to consciously base itself on the old Jewish left, which is dead. Uh, but maybe unconsciously there would be some kind of continuity, um, a kind of unconscious connection with the past. And that would be a remarkable example of Jewish historical continuity, if it happens. Thank you. We have about 15 minutes for questions. Uh, so I guess we will use the, the uh, procedure that's been uh, established for the conference and we'll uh, alternate sides. So why don't we... Gen I, go ahead. Go okay. Ahead um, Ezra, first of all, thank you so much. Thank you for your personal reflections. Thank you for your insight. Thank you for your deep historical knowledge. Um, I, I'm not in a position to respond to you and I wouldn't... I'm not in a position to respond to you, and I wouldn't even if I could. But I want to say a few words, if I may, as part of a dialogue. You know better than I do that the left is not all of a piece. And I, of course, was never associated with the Communist Party or anything, anything of the kind. No, I, I, allow me for a minute. As you know, since we're sort of in a reflective mode at the moment, I was associated with the Bund. And I was associated rather closely with the tiny remnant of the Bund that had survived in the period when I was growing up. And I want to say here, because I actually think it's important, and I actually do think that maybe it's an alternative perspective in part to what you were saying, that, and I understand it's not what you were trying to say, but I don't want to leave a bad impression, I'm, I'm not ashamed or embarrassed by my association with the Bund. And indeed, I'm very proud of it. And I am confident that there are lots of people here who are very proud of their associations with any number of different aspects of the, of the Jewish left. I'm, I'm proud to have known them. I'm proud to have learned from them. Um, I'm sobered and I'm saddened by the state of the world. I'm sobered and I'm saddened by the state of, of Israel. You know, we, we made our, our choices along the way and you, you made a, a choice to, to move there and you made a choice to make a career there and to make a, a life there. And I made a choice to stay here. And I feel an obligation, for better or for worse, to keep on keeping on. Mm -hmm. To keep on keeping on, that is to say yeah. that I don't fool myself into thinking that the left is strong in, in America, but I feel an obligation to continue to identify myself with what I continue to see as the forces of good. And that means, in the American context, the democratic left. I, uh... <laughs> I never uh, suggested that anyone should be ashamed of being associated with Jewish social democracy. Never. Certainly not with the Bund, uh, which I love, and which my father was uh, once affiliated with when he was a young man. Um, and, and I know, for, uh, for example, that the most wonderful example of Jewish, Jewish universalism with a commitment to Jewish continuity were the Bundes schools in interwar Poland. I didn't have the, well, it would have been bad luck, I suppose, to study in these schools. These were the seashore schools. Um, uh, but I have been taught.
told by many people who study that that was a remarkable example of blending universal uh, values with uh, Jewish commitment. It was a special kind of Jewish commitment, of course, but it was a Jewish commitment. These schools were not that popular, but they attracted thousands of students, and these students were inculcated by these ideals, and I honor them as much as I can. Um, maybe I'll just say in parentheses that in a couple of weeks we're both going to a conference in Warsaw on the history of the Bund, financed by the Rosa Luxemburg Stiftung, which is a bit of an irony given her attitude towards Jewish nationalism. But that's another story. Professor Mendelssohn, I wonder whether or not we can entertain the possibility that the phenomenon that we're coming to grips with that you eloquently spoke of is really a massive case of transformizo, what Gramsci uh -huh. called transformizo, which is to say that the, the energies of liberal internationalist interventionism, support of human rights and women's rights have for better or for worse been co-opted by, as very unpleasant as it is to say the names associated with Leo Strauss, Wolfowitz, Robert Kagan, etc., who are justifying those kinds of interventions, and also, of course, the state of Israel at a time when the UN, founded on the ruins of, the, of Europe and the Holocaust, has countries like Libya and Iran dictating its human rights policy, and Israel, a place that had transgendered uh, personnel in the military when gay were not allowed in the United States military, let alone freedom in any other countries in the Middle East, whether or not the perspective, at least in the younger generation, has been affected by that kind of larger shift. Oh, I think that's a, that's a good point. Obviously, a lot of the old left agenda has been enacted, even beyond their wildest dreams. And this is true in Israel, too. Yeah, I, 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 I certainly accept that. Of course, the problem in Israel is not um, one of accepting women. I mean, women have always been in the Israeli on things like that. Uh, we, we live, uh, there are two Israels. Um, one is one side of the Green Line, the other is the other side of the Green Line. Those of us who are lucky enough to live on one side of the Green Line live in a democratic country. And we have rights and we uh, exploit them and we do not feel threatened. And in that sense, Israel, Israeli social democracy has, has triumphed. And, um, the, the, other, the, the problem of the other Israel is, is something else. Um, but I, I, I accept uh, a lot of what you say, I, although I'm not an expert on international affairs, but I, I think you are right. By the way, a recent history of the left in general by a Michigan historian, what's his name? Um, anyway, um, one of the um, recent efforts to kind of sum up the left makes that argument that although the left today looks uh, battered and defeated, it has in fact triumphed uh, to a very great extent. And uh, I think that's true, yeah. Would you agree that perhaps the future can be found in the New York Times obituary page, where what happens is everyone discovers suddenly that they're philanthropic as they die. <laughs> and nobody writes about the person's accomplishments financially which is fine. What they write about is their tzedakah and their tikkun olam. Mm -hmm. And perhaps that's the future of Judaism, mm -hmm. with a particularism of whether right or left being irrelevant. But what is irrelevant is the spirit of the Jews through social action mm -hmm. as, reform, as, re, as the reform movement represents. Mm -hmm. Do you agree with that? Um, uh, I, I'm not sure I... Quite, and what you're saying is that what is dominant in the Jewish tradition is the tradition of giving charity, and uh, that will live on. Is that is that true? Hmm? Clicking along. Ah, tikkun olam. Well, that's a real can of worms. Tikkun olam. Be malchut shaddai. Don't forget the second half in the kingdom of God. Um, I hope we have a better future than in the obituary columns of the newspaper. 
But I mean, in fact, you're right. We'll all end up there if we're lucky. Uh, yeah, I, I think certainly that there is something in, in that, and I think that a lot of people in the Jewish New Left have emphasized this idea of tikkun olam. Tikkun olam is a tricky concept, though. By the way, the, the name of the journal of the Jewish Left in America is tikkun, right? Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Professor Mendelssohn. Um, my, my brief comment, I hope, is this. I'm a very slow learner. So when I was a kid growing up, I had a tremendous empathy. I had a tremendous empathy with the underdog, with the suffering. When I was a kid, I, I tried to save stray kittens. When I got older and politically conscious, it became American blacks. It became South Africans, it became Vietnamese, homosexuals, uh, gay people, feminists, women. It went on and on and on and on. And I, I wasn't a self-hating Jew. I just felt sorry for everybody else, for all the underdogs of the world and how much they suffered. And as I said, I'm a slow learner. So it took me quite a few decades to realize of all the people, of all the groups that I empathized with, who is the greatest underdog of all, and which group of all of them is the only one that faces possible extinction, because the others won't be wiped out. And I'd like to know how you feel about that, my identification as a Jew now. I don't see any uh, conflict between feeling sorry for and sympathizing with oppressed peoples or poor peoples and being a proud Jew. I don't see, I don't understand the, the problem. What, what, what is the problem? Uh, why can't you be both? Uh, I, I, uh, I think that this is what the best in the Jewish left did. It uh, combined a, a, a universalist attitude with a positive attitude towards Jewish existence. It what kind of Jewish existence is, is another story, but why? Can one not feel sorry for one's fellow man or, or, or woman and at the same time remain lo loyal or, or I don't know, positive or, or um, uh, full of admiration for one's own uh, people and its achievements and uh, then also be aware of its failures? I mean, what, what, what exactly is, the, what, why is this a problem? Uh, it becomes a problem only if you do one at the total exclusion of the other. Um, and this is what uh, many of our, of our fellow Jews did. Uh, in, uh, I, I think it was maybe Yaakov Gladstein, one of the Jewish, uh, Yiddish poets in America in the, I think in the 40s said, too many Jews are in the common turn and not enough are in the Yidden turn. Um, common, common turn was the communist international. The Yidden turn was a term he made up, the Jewish international. Of course, that's a term that anti-Semites use, but he was not using it in that sense. He was using it in the sense of being part of one's own people. But I have seen the effect of abandoning one's own and completely devoting oneself to others, and they are not always uh, positive. Uh, I think they are very often destructive. Uh, and, of course, we went through that kind of uh, period in our history, and there are reasons for it. I mean, I understand why Jews became communists, um, but I'm not uh, proud of it. Professor Mendelssohn, in 1957, I took a course in City College with Sam Hendel in Soviet politics. Mm -hmm. And we had reviewed what happened in 1956, the 20th Congress, the Hungarian Rebellion, and all of the horrors and mistakes. Now, Professor Hendel was not easy to give an opinion. He only wanted to talk about facts, and he didn't want to give judgments. However, when I asked him where he thought the left went wrong, his conclusion was, when they abdicated their moral judgment. I ask you the same question. Where do you think the left went wrong? I agree with him. I, I of course, admit depends what you mean by moral judgment. I mean, uh, look, uh, um, 
I, I know something about Jewish communism in Eastern Europe and uh, in the Soviet Union. And I know that there were idealistic people there. There were. There's no question about it. They believed what they were doing. But look, look, look what, what they did. Um, Yevsek people, the uh, Jewish section of the uh, Soviet Communist Party, which included a lot of former Bundes. After all, we should keep in mind also that communism was a movement that developed out of socialism, on the whole, largely, which uh, raises questions about socialism as well. But I understand that these people thought they were building a new world. And that would be a good world, a good world for Jews. But they, they had lost a kind of, I think they had lost some kind of moral judgment. Maybe this is easy for me to say. I, I, you know, I didn't go through that. And I admit it. And it is easy to judge, especially when you have not been through these situations. And the Jewish tradition says, Don't do not judge your friend until you have been in his place or have experienced what he has experienced. And uh, look, my, uh, my family that was full of communists, uh, they were wonderful people. They would not harm a fly. I've often thought of this, but I don't, I'm not happy about what they did. And I think they did abdicate some kind of, they, they should have known more. They could have known more. And it's a question of knowing and knowing. They couldn't believe, they wouldn't believe. Eventually, they did believe, but it was in many cases. Anyway, I, I, I think your teacher's comment was, is, is, is a good one. I, I, would, I would buy it. Yes, uh, Professor Mendel, it, it seems to me that this conference is premised, or the background to it, is a double crisis, a crisis on the one hand of Jewish peoplehood and the sense that perhaps the Jewish people have been irredeemably fragmented by a process of modernity, and on the other hand of a crisis of the left, of a crisis of the concept of the left. And it seems to me that that crisis goes back a very long time and that the first phase of that was a very strong attraction of Jews to the left, a kind of merging of those two crises, and now there's a bifurcation. And I guess I'd like you to talk about what future, if any, you would see for the left at all or for the Jewish people at all, and specifically the concept People spoke about social justice linking the Jewish past to Jewish modernity, but what about the concept of the messianic? What about the concept of Jewish socialism and communism or, or Jews in the socialism as embodying some kind of desire for a messi, re, messianic redemption in a secular world? Um, of course, there is a connection between le the left, the Jews, and messianism. There's no question about it. Um, uh, many people, a lot of people have written about this. I want to uh, address the, the question of what, I think I understood you to say, what, what's in it for the Jews no, no. To, to ally themselves with the left? Is this what you asked? No, I mean, in terms of, I, I take that for granted, but uh, in terms of the future, yeah. either the left or the Jewish people, it seems to me that there's a lot of sort of backward-looking and nostalgic sense yeah. that both the left and the Jewish people are yeah. no longer what they were. No, no, no one is. <laughs> we are, uh, of course, there's a lot of nostalgia. You feel it here. Uh, we felt it these last two days about the Jews and the left. It's, uh, it's, it seems to many of us to be a very good chapter in our history, but one that is gone. Um, I. Uh, I think that it will be revived. I mean, I, I have that. I, I don't really know how to relate to your question. But if it's a question of what, there's this, this split now, and, you know, what's going to happen next. Um, Is there a future for the left in general? Absolutely. I, I mean, uh, look, we, history moves in, in mysterious ways. You know, um, uh, let, let us assume that the war of 67 had not happened. Israel's history would be different. Um, we can't say exactly what it would be, but it, for sure it would have been different. In, a, in six days, our world changed. Things change. And uh, the left, whatever the left is, and what is how to define it, is, is obviously a problem. There is a left 
in America, for sure. Uh, there, is, there is a left in Israel. We saw a bit of a revival of it in the movement of last summer of uh, social protest against uh, high prices and so forth. That, that is also a movement of the left. Sure, there is, there is a future. You think the future is only more and more horrible nationalism and hatred of, of everyone who isn't you? I hope not. I, I don't think so. I've read recently a few books about Croatia for some reason. <laughs> Croatia seems horrible because uh, after Tito, uh, it was a nation state in which the main objective is to get rid of everyone in the country who isn't a Croat and to hate everyone who isn't a Croat, especially the Serbs who are basically speak the same language and are Christians, just a uh, different kind of Christians, but anyway, to hate them and to hate everybody and to hate communism and, and to deny everything about the country's uh, uh, history and to rewrite its history and to rewrite everything. It seems so. Is that the, is that the end of the Croatian story? I don't think so. And I think history teaches us to be patient. You know, you have to, you have to see new developments. Did anyone expect the new left? How many people wrote the obituary of the left in pre-68 America? So, yeah, I think there, there, is, there is hope. Israel is in a special situation with, in regard to this because nationalism has a special appeal to Jews who feel surrounded, who recall this, the, the Shoah, who listen to Ahmadinejad, who, uh, who, who look at uh, various intellectuals who want to boycott the country, who see what happens when you leave a part of the occupied territories and suddenly the bombs are falling all over the place. So this is obviously a, a difficult situation for the left to be in. But uh, what we see today, we may not see uh, tomorrow. There's two more people on each side, so a very, very brief Thanks. This is the last session. I just wanted to share a three-sentence reflection, which is that I question that the left is dead. The Jewish left is dead unless it's defined incredibly narrowly as communists doing the stuff that they did in a particular time. So, so I, my question was just how you were defining the left. Last week, I was at a conference of 250 young community organizers who were Jewish, who were studying Jewish text, learning skills. Many, very few of them, which I think is very interesting, are, are drawn to union organizing or interested in a class analysis. Far more of them are, are drawn to questions of gender. Um, many of them are doing uh, interfaith, cross-class, cross-race organizing. And, and many more of them, I think, are drawn to um, Jewish text and tradition in complex ways. And one example of that that I saw was both the Kol Nidre and Simchat Torah services at Occupy Wall Street. So I, I, I'm not arguing that that is a full-blown revival of competing, you know, Yiddish newspapers. But I, I'm just curious why you think the left is completely dead. <laughs> I'm glad to, you know, I don't think anything is completely dead. Even the Bund is not completely dead, we heard from uh, Jack. No, it's not, uh, you know, it lives on in him and in others. My dissertation advisor at Columbia was, uh, was Alex Ehrlich, who was the son of uh, Henrik Ehrlich, the famous Polish Bundist, and he was a Bundist. And Yivo was once very much a kind of Bundist, although... The Bund didn't really like Ivo so much because of its, its bourgeois status. Uh, no, I don't, no, I don't mean completely. What I, meant was by the, what I meant by the Jewish left is organizations speaking Jewish languages, um, catering only to Jews, um, engaged actively in the struggle for social justice and internationalism and so forth and so on. Uh, of course, it's hard to define what the left is. If you think that that group of 250 young people is the left, then, then you, you may think so. Um, you know, it, it doesn't sound to me like what I would call the Jewish left. And not every Jewish organization is the Jewish left, right? Um, but, but you're right to question the issue of definition. and We just, I guess, don't have time for that here. But I do think in kind of traditional terms of the old Jewish left, 
uh, being, you know, the parties, the unions, the uh, newspapers and all of that. And I think that is not completely dead, but pretty much has passed away. I liked very much the way you treated the question of how do we come to terms with the unfortunate and unpleasant fact that uh, Jews were involved in the most murderous aspects of the so Soviet and uh, other East European regimes. I think shame is the appropriate reaction to some of these developments and personally as somebody who was involved in the communist movement in South Africa, I do feel myself a sense of shame, for instance, when in 1959 I justified the Chinese invasion of Tibet on the grounds that this would ultimately be a progressive development. At the same time, I think that more important than shame is an acceptance of the past. The past can't be changed, and the first thing that we have to do is merely to understand how these things happened and what actually happened. And on that context, I think that the larger context of com history of communism is a little bit more complicated than is sometimes suggested. One of the features of the communist movement is that it constantly threw up from within it, like Christianity, people who said the original precepts of the movement have been abandoned. We need to get back to what it was really like at the beginning. I can mention many, Khrushchev, Dubček, Gorbachev. And what is important about communism in Europe, uh, Chinese communism is a, a different phenomenon, is that it liquidated itself in the end. And uh, I, I don't take as pessimistic a view on Croatia or indeed on the South Slavs as you do, but that's a, a different subject. I would also say, again, speaking as somebody who l abandoned the South African communist movement when in 1967 the South African Communist Party and the ANC issued a statement applauding the fraternal intervention uh, of the Warsaw Pact countries in uh, Czechoslovakia. Nevertheless, the fact that we have in South Africa a democratic system today and one in which which race is not the key problem in politics after 300 years of oppression uh, which surpassed anything that happened in this country is partly, not only, a result of the commitment of the Marxist-Leninist politics to something which transcends narrow ethnic divisions. Of course, in South Africa, the communists never took, took control of the state, did they? I mean, this, this, was, this is a paradox of communism. I mentioned this, that when they are not in power, they are often fighting for very decent goals. There's no question about it. The whole communist movement in America was committed, I mean, at least ostensibly, to the struggle for equality for blacks. It was. And they even, as is well known, went so far as to declare that the blacks might be a nationality. And this was a common turn decision, <laughs> which drove the Jewish communism, communists into a frenzy, uh, trying to figure out what to do now because they had always claimed that the Negroes, as they were then called, were not a nationality, but they should integrate. This is what was mentioned, I think, earlier today by uh, Professor Kerr. Anyway, Claire, um, uh, yeah, the, the, of course the situation in South Africa is a very p particular one, isn't it? But let, let us just say that the Joe Slovos and their non-Jewish friends had taken power in South Africa and created a communist regime in South Africa, what would have happened then? There would have been another Cuba or another Angola. Yeah. I'm afraid. Yeah. It would have been another Cuba or another Angola. Angola. Yeah. Okay. Two more, yeah. one over here and one over here. Um, it's been a wonderful discussion. I've only been here today. I missed yesterday's. But I think the framing of this conference has been both histor historical but also nostalgic. And I think that the voice that's missing is the voice of the left. I, I think it's dismissive to say that Occupy Wall Street was about higher prices or a pr protest of higher prices. There was an intent, all right. Well, yes, I, I did, excuse me, I did hear that. And it's not, I, hold on, let me just finish. I don't know anything about it. Let me just finish what I'm saying, please. There was a consistent and very numerous Jewish president, a presence at Occupy Wall Street. Mm -hmm. There was Occupy Yom Kippur, Occupy Sukkot, Occupy... And no, it's not a joke, and you people are laughing because you didn't see the entire plaza across from Zuccotti Park filled with Jews celebrating as Jews in whatever, whatever regalia they chose to wear the entire high holy period of the high holy days. 
there's Jews for Racial and Economic Justice. There is, um, not only are Jews powering a lot of the political movements, including organizations like Footsteps that help people that want to leave orthodoxy integrate into se sort of a secular Jewish culture, which I think is a political act, the Klezmer revival. There are many things that we can talk about where I believe that uh, Jews are intensely principled, intensely leftist, and carrying on many of the best traditions that many of the people have talked about here today. So I just think we're missing certain voices in the room. And I'm not expecting that you are the arbiter of, you know, and I, don't, I know you don't put yourself up to be the arbiter of, of the future of the Jewish left. I'm just saying programmatically, I think that that's one of the voices that is, we haven't heard from in the first person. I, uh, I'm happy to accept that as a very important crit criticism. I don't know anything about these movements, or hardly anything. I, I do a, a little bit about Klezmer, so I am surprised to hear that that is a movement of the Jewish left. <laughs> Unless you want to say that celebrating the old country and its musical tradition is a left-wing... Transforming. Transforming what? Transforming the inheritance. The inheritance, yeah. Well, no, but that is, that is not what I mean by the left. If, if, if you want to talk about Jewish organizations that are, not, that are against assimilation, then why not go to the Orthodox Jewry? There they are. They are the bastion of anti-assimilation, but they are not the left, as we know. Anyway, thank you for your... One last, uh, one last question. What, you made an important point when you said that the future of Jewish social democracy is the future in Israel. And I want you to see if you can say something about how can the Jewish Americans, and especially the Jewish left in America, help to support the success of the revival of social democracy in Israel? I, I, I think we already heard about this from Professor Walzer, and if you heard his lecture, at the end he's, he ended by saying, uh, we cannot uh, here in this country decide for the Jews of Israel what they should do, but uh, we can help uh, to support those movements that we find to be agreeable with our worldview, with our Weltanschauung. And, uh, American Jews certainly can help, and they are helping. I mean, there are American Jewish organizations. That, I mean, I, I don't want to take sides here. If you think that the situation in Israel is bad and should be repaired in some way, and, then that, and that the repairing should be done through the uh, instrument of some kind of new social democratic party, uh, which is, I guess, what I think, um, then you need allies. And just as the Israeli right, uh, the Israeli government has its allies in this country, as we know, and they, I think this is legitimate and legal as far <laughs> as I know. There is an, a, an American Jewish billionaire who publishes a newspaper that is handed out in Hebrew in Israel every day for free. And as far as I know, that is legal. Uh, and this is a right-wing newspaper. That is a newspaper that identifies with the present governor, then uh, American Jews who do not agree with this millionaire and who have different views on the future of Israel can also do, do something like that. I mean, uh, and, and they do, and we know that they are, they are there. And uh, I think Michael Walzer said it better than I can say. He said, just help if you, if, if you feel that you should. And... Um, there is a long uh, Jewish tradition within the Zionist movement of accepting help from all kinds, from all sides, from everywhere, virtually, from Christian uh, um, fundamentalists to, uh, to communists, and uh, all over the world, uh, Jews and, and non-Jews. And so uh, American Jews have a, if they want to do it, they have a, a role to play in this, and they have played this role pretty consistently, uh, sometimes more, sometimes less. Uh, I don't know what American Jews think about the situation. I mean, I haven't seen any polls. We know what APAC thinks. We know there is J Street. 
there are a multiplicity of ideas. And if you think that social democracy would be a good thing for Israel, then you can help. Okay, thank you very much, uh, you. Professor Mendelssohn, and thank you for coming uh, and making it a great conference.